Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Faustine Chan. I'm the Business Innovation Manager for BBB, serving the Pacific Southwest. Um, so I'm helping coordinate these daily webinars um, with different themes just to help business owners during this time just to provide free education for you so you can use it um, for your business. This webinar is being recorded, so if any time you do need to leave or if you miss any of the information or if you'd like to share it with any of your employees, um, it is being recorded and it will be posted on events.bbbcommunity.org um, within one to do business days. And you can also sign up for different webinars on there and also review past webinars that have been recorded. So today we have um, a great speaker today. We actually had him um, a couple weeks ago. We have Navel Villamoria. He is the Senior Vice President at Mission Fed. He's an effective communications and values leader who believes in growing organizations through external marketing. He's also known for empowering communities with his experience and energy. So please welcome our speaker today, Navel. Thank you, Faustine, and thanks for all your help putting these together for everyone. Special thanks to the BBB. Um, so welcome. If you're joining us again, you're a repeat offender from the last go-around, welcome back. Obviously, we provided some of your consequence, so you wouldn't be here. And if it's your first time, welcome. The topic alone suggests that you have some interest in and support of what we're doing, because it's not your kind of regularly scheduled program, so to speak. Uh, we have an hour together. My goal is to try to provide you with a construct as well as an experience to help you leave a little bit better off than when you joined us on the call at one o'clock. Or if you're watching this remotely, uh, hopefully this is a value to you as well whenever you're having, finding the time to, to go through it. Uh, the topic is leading consciously with purpose. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to unpack the leadership part, the purpose part, and then address it both individually through our individual or personal um, orientation as well as consider the business implications of that. So let's get right into it. Um, or not. So the goals for the session, uh, again, I, I would be hopeful that at the end of this, you will have got some clarity both in your head about approaches and choices that you can make, but more importantly in your body and being about how you can show up differently. Um, we'll do some centering exercises. This is about consciousness. And I have brought my trusted little bowl with me, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. Um, and time permitting, we'll have some Q&A. Should we run out of time? Because I'm apt to add more content than I probably deserve to put in a, a single hour. By all means, please reach out via email or otherwise so that I can answer all of your questions. Uh, setup. Uh, like last time, I think it's important to, we all have biases, and I'm very transparent about mine. Um, it's about both Western science and Eastern wisdom traditions. I've been a practitioner and teacher of those for a while, and I find those to be incredibly useful at this, in these times. Uh, unlike a traditional deficit model where we're always looking at the gap and trying to mind the gap and fill the gap, I think a strengths-based framework can be really useful here. And I'm going to unpack positive organizational scholarship in just a minute because I think that's a great uh, context for the work we do. It's outside in for many of us, but today I'm going to suggest it's actually an inside-out job. That leadership, conscious leadership begins within, good leadership period is within, and we're going to access a lot of these resources and tools by going within. Uh, a we, not me orientation, now is a time to really be attentive, not only to self-care, but also to how we can help each other. And at the end of the day, whatever business operation, enterprise, nonprofit you're running, there's a cultural component to it. And don't just focus on strategy. Yes, we're going to have to find ways to pivot and respond. But on the other hand, the real main objective is to maintain and preserve the culture that many of us have worked so hard to develop in our respective organizations. Um, the reason I have that Imagine slide, both as my background currently, as well as on this, is that a negative worrying is negative goal setting. And our imagination oftentimes is the preview of coming attraction. So our ability to actually imagine and intentionally create the world we want to see on a go forward basis can be a huge driver in terms of the actual outcome we have. So if we get caught in our survival brain, which is, tends to be worrying and stressed and anxiety provoking, it's hard to, to dig out and see choices. Uh, and I'm not minimizing the importance of that. We'll talk about that momentarily, but it's more about recognizing when we're in survival brain or reactive brain and when we're more in creative or thrive opportunity brain. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I referenced a positive organization scholarship. It's a body of work that I was introduced to by a dear friend, Dr. Alan Daly at UC San Diego some years ago, and it just provided me with a, a context for this. So 
uh, let's look at the world that you are living in now, we are living in together, and ask ourselves again imaginatively, what kind of world do we want? So one world is a world that's typified by greed, selfishness, single-minded focus on winning. It's all about wealth creation. And the members of these kind of cultures and climates tend to be anxiety, self-absorbed, fear-based, and stress taken to its unnatural conclusion leads to burnout. Uh, the researchers that study this from, through this lens tend to focus on problem solving, appropriately so, reciprocity, managing uncertainty, overcoming resistance, achieving profitability, and competing, all of which are hugely important, and I'm not minimizing them, but I'm going to invite us to also consider another world, another world where organizations are typified by their appreciation, collaboration, virtuosity, and virtuousness, vitality, uh, and abundance and well-being are really the keys to success, not just profitability. And here are the people that show up in these organizations tend to be highly trustworthy, they're resilient, they have wisdom, not just smarts, they have humility, and high levels of positive energy. I would suggest all those are hugely important characteristics for a conscious leader in our current times. And here are social relationships, which as we know are super important, are uh, uh, supported and uh, held with compassion, with empathy, with respect, forgiveness. And instead of focusing on just maximizing profit, which is certainly important, no margin, no mission, it's about what can we do to make life worth living. And here the theory, the research, the focus is really on excellence, transcendence. I like to think of all of us on the call as, pos as positive deviants. We're trying to do something different and show up differently. And as a result, help all of our individual communities, organizations thrive and flourish. So the question as we start is, which world is it that you want to live in in the post-COVID era? Is it uh, are the habitual characteristics, the conventional frameworks adequate for you? Or are you yearning for and have we all woken up to the need for a little bit more than that? And again, my intention is not to suggest the old worldview is bad. It's just to say that we need to not just focus on that. We can add, augment, supplement. It's an and, not an or phenomenon. And if we're able to incorporate some of these other principles and practices, perhaps we can be better conscious leaders and do better purposeful work. So as I said, it starts within. And so the first question we've really got to ask is, um, who am I and why am I here? And you know, what would I what I really want. And so as you reflect on those deeper existential questions that I think many of us have had to face by default or design, given the uh, healthcare challenges, given members, maybe of even our immediate families have had an immediate and deleterious impact from this terrible pandemic. Uh, it's forcing us to ask more thoughtful existential questions. And my assumption is you wouldn't be on this call if those were not the type of things that you were addressing too. I think that it, it takes courage to really show up and let your authentic self come out in these times. It's easier to hunker down and um, hide behind the veils of propriety, um, you know, however we, we mask our own authenticity. And so today my invitation like this butt naked picture of me from just a few years ago suggests is let's, let's have the courage to actually show up and address these issues head on. So when you, a lot of work Mission Fed does is with our blessed educational community. And every time we go to school, we tend to take attendance, right? So taking attendance is asking if we're present. I'd like to invite us all to start by getting present, because if we're going to do leadership consciously, we've got to get present. So join me for just a minute of present moment mindfulness, supported by my beloved singing bowl that has been resonated to open your heart. So wherever you are, if you're comfortable. Um, yeah, quit looking at your email. Be here now. If that email is more important, you probably want to go take care of that and you can watch this later. But if you're going to commit to your own conscious leadership, let's start by entering into presence, into where we are right now. And I can't think of a faster way. Well, the fastest way is through your breath. So why don't you breathe in and connect for a few moments, one minute, as I set this bell into motion for you.
taking a few moments for self-regulation, self-reflection to just be here now. In these crazy times, we can find ourselves either way into the future, awfulizing, worrying, anticipatory stress and grief. Um, and the antidote for that is actually drawing ourselves back in the present moment. The only place that change happens is in the internal present, and that's a gift. So I invite us periodically to stop, breathe, and return to the present moment so we can make good conscious choices. Um, I would like to posit that over the course of human evolution, we've gone through a few different phases. Uh, our initial birth and then a phase when we were completely dependent on the high priests uh, to make sense of the world. They spoke the language of God or faith or science, and they were going to decode everything. Today's technologists maybe in some ways play that role. Uh, and then we moved into this phase of the Renaissance, the rebirth, where our orientation was really about free will and uh, manifesting our own destiny, if you will. I, with COVID, I believe we've actually entered a fourth phase of the human experience where interdependency has become tantamount. We can no longer be self-reliant and as important as our self-efficacy is, uh, it, without a we frame, our ability to actually affect and sustain deep and uh, pronounced uh, change is probably limited. So here's a wake up call and an invitation to enter a potentially a fourth phase. Each of those phases we've, that I referenced have an adaptive and maladaptive function. There's some great things about each of them, but there's some limitations to each of them. So our objective is really to be present with where we are, not just in the moment, but where we are as a societal system and recognize when change happens, how we can be uh, adaptable. It's survival of the adaptable, not survival of the fittest, if you read Darwin properly and resilient, because resiliency is the antidote for that stress and burnout that we talked about earlier, and we talked about in the last session, which you might actually want to get a copy of the video on YouTube. So our self-centeredness, our tribalism, our uh, old model, again, is in, is in under, either under threat, if you're concerned about preserving the status quo, or under the opportunity for emergence and growth. And I'd prefer to see it as the latter. Uh, much of our quest as seekers, human beings are meaning makers. We're always seeking meaning and purpose, and we will ascribe meaning and purpose to everything. Uh, means we ask a lot of questions, and those are really good. And maybe we just need to ask better questions. And so the first question, which is a reminder from the last go around too, is how do I want to show up? Who do I want to be? You know, what, how can my most authentic, my aspirational self, my conscious self, my most mindful um, in service self attend, be here, as opposed to being paralyzed or anxiety provoked or checked out or all the other very appropriate grief responses. Um, so we could be in fear, we can be in learning or we can be in growth and we'll come back to this later. Right now it's really a reminder that we do have a choice. That we may feel like our operating systems have been hijacked by COVID and the pandemic and sequestration and everything else but I would suggest we do actually do have a choice. We don't have a choice of what happens to us. We do have a choice how we respond to what happens to us. So conscious leadership. Uh, the conscious for me is about intention, attention, and attitude. And leadership is suggesting that all leadership is an active influence. And if it's an active influence, then maybe we can actually together stand up a new social contagion, a positive one uh, that can be the antidote and be the way out from our current circumstance. I'm gonna later talk about business evolution, which has gone through four phases, not dissimilar to the ones I mentioned earlier. And again, always tying it back to the personal. I think leadership is an inside job. Uh, if we're not able to be self-reflective, uh, self-aware, authentic, vulnerable, high trust leaders based on both our affect uh, and how we show up as well as our competency in terms of what we know, it's difficult to lead consciously in these times. It's difficult to lead in any times. Um, the cool thing is that whether it's the wisdom traditions from gazillion years ago or quantum medicine, quantum science, neuroscience from 2,500 milliseconds ago tend to suggest the same things. We are this blend of information and energy and the appropriate exchange of both energy, super important because we tend to privilege information. And uh, so information and energy together is really what constitutes great health, good health. We have this old model of the triune brain that again, referring to our reptilian brain, which is more about survival, 
thank goodness we have that. If our ancestors weren't hoarding, paranoid, um, you know, beings, none of us would, their progeny, us, seven billion plus of us on the planet today wouldn't exist. But when you're staying in that state of mind perpetually, that's just not sustainable. So it's important for us to recognize that our, our survival brain will override our best thinking, our most conscious, erudite, wise choices, unless we're able to find the lever and actually manage and mind the gap. So recognize there's a gap between the stimulus, what happens and the response, how we choose to re react to it. And as a result, we can actually shift that. So the place I want to go today as the kind of the guts of um, the topic is looking at a different model of, the, of how we process, know, make sense of the world. And instead of using that triune brain model, it's really about three different aspects of our personhood, our gut, which in the Eastern traditions really is the, your center of, of personal power. And from your gut, th that's where your bias for action comes from and it requires courage. It's not surprising that the Japanese samurai would commit harakiri and actually disembody, bowel themselves because that was their seat of power. Um, yes, a little bit of a, you know, upsetment maybe from that metaphor, but uh, I think gut and trusting our gut and listening to our gut is something that we, if you listen to people's language closely, they, they reference a lot, but they really don't understand how that actually plays into the other aspects of how we process information. Our heart, I can't think of any time now more than ever when empathy and compassion are absolute job one. And finally, our head, which is not just about smarts and intellectual pursuit, but about wisdom, our ability to um, enlist, recruit our gut, our heart, and our head are probably going to give us a completely different set of toolkit, tools and toolkit to actually support and work on this. So as I mentioned in the wisdom traditions, this notion of intention, attention, awareness uh, can be traced to almost any leader, religious or otherwise. They asked Jesus, do you see, and what is the meaning of life? And he said, do you see what you see? Buddha, are you God? No. Are you the son of God? No. What are you? I'm awake. Zen master, the person comes to the Zen uh, after many years of practice and says, you know, I think I finally got the Zen thing down. He goes, awesome. When you walked in here, it was raining. Uh, I noticed you had your umbrella. Did you put your umbrella on the left side of your shoes or your right side of your shoes? And the practitioner, ah, bah, bah, I'm not sure. Well, you need to keep practicing. So for all of us, the, the lesson, the beginning, the starting point, the platform, the passport to this journey of consciousness is about awareness. There's three key laws that I've found have, have been super informative for me to make sense of this. The law of concentrated attention the law of reversed effect and the law of dominant effect. And I wanna unpack these for you briefly. The law of concentration, concentrated attention suggests that what we focus on manifests. So if right now I say, don't think about monkeys, your subconscious mind immediately starts conjuring up images of monkeys. They might be chimps, they might be orangutans, they might be rhesus, but it's, it's inevitable because the subconscious doesn't understand this absence of. So suggestion becomes super important, back to imagination and, and intention being absolutely critical. Uh, we have um, things, quotes like all's well that ends well. I think that's junk. I think it's all's well that begins well. And right now, as a group, as an individual, as conscious leaders, we can set the intention about how we want to have the outcome work. An exercise that many of you might be familiar with is muscle testing. So if you go to a chiropractor or any other energy work for that matter, one way to test is muscle testing. And you can compare a yes versus a no uh, without the participant telling you which is which, and you can tell how much energy there might be in one versus the other. So again, the law of concentration, concentrated attention suggests that which you focus on manifests. So if you're focusing on worrying, you're gonna end up seeing all the problems. If you're focused on what the opportunity and learning might be, you might have a different set of conditions that you're creating for yourself. The second is law of reversed effect. Here, uh, uh, sorry, all smart, um, highly cerebral folks, on the call and in life, our emotions override our intellect. So no matter how smart we are and how thoughtful we might be and how effective we might be in our thinking capacities, at the end of the day, our emotion will override our logic and then we will justify with the facts. And so here it's reminding us that if, if we are in this conflict between an emotion pulling on us, like a survival emotion and our logic saying, come on Neville, you can do better than that. 
it's really tough to override the power of that emotion. Finally, the law of dominant effect says when you have two emotions, the stronger one will override the other. And so it's recognizing that human beings as amazing, powerful, gifted, wondrous as we are, we tend to be more prone to avoiding pain than gaining pleasure. And so we're actually wired to avoid the pain. And as a result, this will give you some insights into why you might be dwelling a little more in that uh, problem side of the equation rather than the solution side of the equation. I want to deconstruct leadership and management because I think management is all about managing processes, systems. Uh, it's leading has to do with people. And if we're talking about conscious leadership, we absolutely have to attend to uh, not just the conventional geographics and psychographics that many of us are familiar with, but cardiographics, which is a term I co coined to mean the heart to heart connection that we have. We don't have, we, we, we just feel it. We, talk, we hear this anecdotally, we're in a room, we see somebody start talking and immediately we go deep. We feel a connection. Some talk about this as a limbic response. So the other two laws that you might find of value and you can go test them since they're principles. Um, the one thing that everyone will hold true to at any expense is their own self-identity. So if you try to test and push on their self-identity, they're gonna resist you because their self-concept and their perception of their self-concept is so strong and so ingrained. Ours too, by the way, myself included. So if you want to trigger me, uh, challenge my self-concept or my identity, and you'll see immediately how I want to protect, defend, react, um, as opposed to uh, be open, listen, consider. And the other, other law, which I think for leaders is absolutely critical, is when two people come together, the person more committed to their state is going to influence the other. We all have this experience of going into a room and the room is kind of, you know, the energy is like wah, 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 wah. And somebody comes in and they're high energy and pretty soon the whole room gets uplifted. We have the same experience in inverse. The room is energized. Somebody walks in and everything just kind of goes. Zzz. So you have to ask yourself as a conscious leader, how do you want to affect the room? Does the room get better when you walk in or does the room get better when you walk out? Again, it's a function of, when you, two human beings come together, we are so socially connected that the one more committed to their state is gonna influence the other. I've been teaching martial arts at UC San Diego for 38 years now. Every time I walk into the dojo, the place to train the way, I make myself, I, I set an intention. I'm gonna be more committed to my state of positivity than anybody who's walked in this room has had a very hard day, is challenged. I don't know what's gone on, but that's my job is actually to elevate and take it up, to, take it up a level. And I'm going to be so committed to that, that over time, they are going to um, adjust, accommodate because of that energetic. So those are a few laws that you might find of value. Um, attention, intention, attitude. I touched on these in the last um, seminar as well, but I think they're super important. Uh, intention, if, if it's mind, body, spirit, it, uh, intention is really all about our spirit. And it's believing that instead of a dysfunctional or negative um, universe, the universe actually is conspiring to manifest whatever we want. So if you can trust that the universe wants the greatest good for you, and you can set the intention that you're going to harmonize with nature and the universe, it's much more likely that you're going to feel like you're on the path of flow and connection and right, um, doing good, doing well by doing good. Uh, attention is what we are paying attention to. Again, that law of concentrated attention. So there's so much talk today about mindfulness, meditation, centering. I mean, it, you, you think it was the latest thing. I like to think it's 2,500 years old. It's the latest thing. But all that is predicated on the mirror being able to actually see a true reflection of what is. In this case, the metaphor is our mind is the mirror. And if our mind is distorted by our own biases, fears, social constructs, social hypnosis, cultural conditioning, then we really don't see what is, like the Jesus example earlier, do you see what you see? No, we don't see what we see, we see what we wanna see. We see what we're conditioned to see. So the challenge and opportunity for us as conscious leaders is actually to polish our mind through mindfulness, breath work, centering practices. There's a gazillion different ways to do it in order to actually see what is, not seeing a fuzzy picture because we, and we think it's the camera, it's not the camera. Uh, it's us that that uh, getting up, uh, seeing the image poorly. And finally, because this is about conscious leadership and heart, how we attend is supercritical in the Orient. 
this, the word for heart, mind, shin, sometimes called kokoro, is, is heart and mind together. They don't deconstruct heart and mind. And in, again, in our tr wisdom tradition, we talk about shin, ki, tai, ichi. Heart, mind, breath, body, one. Heart, mind, energy, body, one. The goal is to bring these together. On the previous webinar, we talked about the root for the world. Health is whole, to be whole. So here's another wonderful cross-cultural reinforcement that wholeness, the absence of suffering is when we're not no longer fragmented, but we actually can bring together our heart, mind, and spirit. In the internal arts, um, Chinese Qigong in particular, they talk about these three energy centers that correspond with the courage, heart, and uh, insight or wisdom that I referenced earlier. And wh what I think is really cool about that is that in the, one is about uh, building the energy at your primal level and then having it ascend to open up your heart energy, which then in turn allows you to have wisdom. And there's a sequence to that. So it begins with our for formulating our courage and self-confidence and self-efficacy. And once you have that, then you're able to actually make space and open your heart for other people um, beyond just yourself. You're not just so self-centered that it's all about you. And with those, that uh, embodies wisdom and a deeper understanding that maybe we need now more than ever. I love it when East and West reinforce the same thing in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. No, he did not have toilet paper when he created it, but I thought I, I couldn't leave that out. It was just too good to be true. I really, if you were gonna take the three la layers that I referenced on the previous slide and map those to Maslow, you could think about it as psychological and personal safety at the base, love and belonging, and then self-actualization and purpose. And our job is to actually integrate East and West if wholeness is the bringing of the two together, it certainly is for me. And whichever construct resonates for you, go with it. Uh, but the, the appeal to you today is to invite, enlist, recruit another way of knowing and considering when you're in which particular state. So today with some training and practice and attention, I can tell, I can walk into a room and say, that person is not feeling psychologically safe. And so I need to attend to, I need to care for and attend to their psychological safety to talk about meaning and purpose and significance is at this point, not worth the time. Not that it's not important and not, it's not that they can't do it. It's just not where they're at right now. Meet them where they're at. Um, the interesting thing here is when you're able, it's much easier when you're in a place of significance and purpose to recognize when somebody's psychologically unsafe. It's a lot harder when you're feeling psychologically unsafe to recognize that somebody's insignificance and meaning. So there's an ascendancy here, just like in the East, and the sequencing matters to put it in um, terms of execution. We should all be here to help each other. And so I wanna talk about purpose because this is also part of the title. And uh, moment, in a little bit, I'll talk about Ikigai, which is an Okinawan construct where the alignment of your mission, vocation, profession, and passion all come together. Uh, Ikigai from Okinawa. Okinawa is one of the blue zones where people, there's a lot of centenarians, people that live long, long lives and they try to decode why is it that in Loma Linda, California, for example, uh, or uh, Okinawa, these people s t seem to have long, healthy, vibrant lives. And one of the answers is clearly that they are con clearly aligned with their purpose. They answered those earlier questions about who am I, why am I here, what do I want? And that gives them that bolsters them, that fortifies them, that gives them the capacity to live long, healthy lives. Something that we may want to attend uh, to, something that we as conscious leaders may want to uh, create as cult part of our cultural norms, that people know that there's meaning and purpose in the work they do, that they're valued, that they matter. Uh, from my experience, th these are the two hats that uh, we struggle with and sometimes wear one at the expense of the other. The hats of self-acceptance, loving me for who I am. Some of us have real difficulty with that self-worthness. Brené Brown's work on worthiness and vulnerability is a wonderful gateway into this. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with it, you can look her up and watch a TED Talk or some of her recent blogs. Um, so the other is self-improvement. So some of us, no matter what we do, it's you, you know, great job. No, no, no. You know, that was nothing. I I don't deserve it because we we cannot self-accept. Others of us are so content to wallow in our self-acceptance that we're not willing to grow and improve. And the, the trick, the nuance, the opportunity is to be able to balance wearing these two hats. When you can figure that out, 
please let me know how you did it because for me this is an endless uh, opportunity in moment by moment reflection and um, response. Vulnerability is a cornerstone of trust and everywhere BBB talks about you know high ethics and trust-based businesses so I would be remiss if I didn't at least take a moment to remind us that if you actually want to show up as a conscious leader you have to be vulnerable. Uh, that anything short of vulnerability as a cornerstone is not going to set the conditions for a high trust environment. And we know how many of us have been conditioned to not be vulnerable. We almost feel like were we to demonstrate a vulnerability that we're not, you know, modeling the leadership qualities that we want. Are we, are we more importantly, or more rightly, ex other people expect of us. I would suggest that actually it's just the opposite. When we're able to be vulnerable, it's much more likely that people can authentically connect with us. And as a result, you get this deeper social connection that allows you to move to a different space. So let's talk about purpose a little bit. Um, part of the journey is to finding out what your own purpose is. If it's clear for you, then live it. If it's not clear, the journey for you maybe is to keep discovering it and asking these hard and important questions. Uh, I, we've talked about uh, in the past nonprofit and for-profit as metaphors or ways that we you know, put organizations in different buckets. So there's people on this call who might work for a for-profit or a not-for-profit. I think these are antiquated notions. I think if you're going to think about us all standing up a 2020 and beyond COVID, post-COVID era, societally and for humanity, then we've got to ask a different set of questions. And the Aspen Institute some years ago came up with this as the fourth sector, the intersection of private, public, and social sectors. And so whether you consider yourself a social enterprise or not, that's not the point. The point is let's quit, let's stop defining ourselves by our legal designation and let's get clear on are we a purpose-driven organization or not? Are we a purpose-driven leader or not? That's a fundamental shift in our mindset, in our intention, in our attention, in our attitude. And that signals who we want to be as, when we grow up as an individual and how we want to grow up as an organization. So for purpose, I think, is the new orientation not, not, versus not for purpose, not for profit or not for profit. Why? Business has evolved. And I mentioned this earlier, there was four phases. Phase one, good old Milton Friedman. The only reason a business exists is to drive profit. So profit first would be the first level of business. At some point, somebody introduced a human to the equation, God bless him. Uh, and the argument here was actually, no, it's customer first. You take care of your customer and they will take care of your profit. So phase two was customer first. Hallelujah, people have been introduced. However, it's still an incomplete model because we, this comes with baggage like the customer is always right. Really? The customer is always right? The customer can walk into a Mission Fred branch and uh, be um, disrespectful to the staff and rude and is that okay? Is it, does that work? So there's some limitations. Good news is people introduce bad news is some baggage. Third level, since the customer expectation rarely exceeds the employee expectation, maybe we need to focus on our culture. And so the third tier of business of, of enterprise, because I don't want it to be just about for-profit enterprise as we have conventionally thought about it, is to say culture first. So culture takes care of customers, customers take care of profit. If you're already here, power to you, but there's actually one more level, so don't give up yet. And this is the Simon Sinek why. Uh, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And here in this ecosystem, not ecosystem, all the stakeholders matter. So of course your employees matter, of course your customers matter, but, and your shareholders or stockholders matter, but your community matters as well. And when you're building a culture around all the stakeholders in the ecosystem mattering deeply and you're attending to all of them thoughtfully, then you're starting to move into a purpose-driven organization. Um, data has suggested that these are highly profitable organizations too, so it's not just social do-good or wannabes. And uh, we don't have a lot of time because we're on our, our chat today, but here's some of the questions that you can reflect on with, when, if you have the inclination and the time and you want to really um, embody this is, you know, where are you on the scale as an individual? Where's your organization? Well, how can we learn from each other? Because if it's a we model, there's probably things you know that I don't and vice versa. Can we share and grow together? And more, most importantly, how am I going to show up differently? What am I going to do differently after this call, after this reflection? The cool thing is, as above, so below. I think that was a Carl, uh, that's the um, neoscientist, but I, I think Carl Rogers was 
that which is most personal is universal. But same sentiment. And these things line up gloriously, whether you're doing it individually or organizationally. And so if you're focused at the organizational level, then these are the things you want to attend to, especially now in the post-COVID era, if you're trying to be leading on purpose, aligning your organizational capacity with market opportunity. So right now at Mission Fed, we're providing financial support, we're providing forbearance on loans, we're providing skip or pay programs, because that's what the market wants. And we can do that. We're not doing PPP, that's not our skill set. that's not our forte. We're a person-to-person -person organization. Employee orientation with customer expectations. Again, since there's a clear line of sight between the employee and the customer, a super clear alignment of that can be powerful right now. Organizational practice stage of business development. Every organization goes through this early startup, growing, maturing, and either flattening out and peaking and dying or rebirth. And uh, we need to shift our leadership style to flex with where we are organizationally. Some of us went from one of those particular areas to another. We might have been highly profitable eight weeks ago and now are in a completely different kettle of fish. So how do we retrench? How do we retool? How do we pivot? And then changing and flexing your leadership style with drivers of the team loyalty. As I said earlier, if someone is feeling psychologically unsafe, I need to meet them where they're at. I can't just try to say, oh, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you know, meet us at this higher plane. Um, that sounds good. That doesn't change anything. So you need to balance, you need to, well, you don't need to. I would hope, I would um, implore <laughs> that you at least consider these. Let's start there. It's the choice is always yours and you can, you know, delete, go back to your old fashioned or regular schedule program or default state, whatever, however you choose to call it, if that's adaptive and working for you. But if these, some of these ideas present new opportunities, new awareness, new ways of being, then let's start doing it. Let's encourage others to do it. And you don't have to change the world. It can start with really small steps. And I think this is getting to the behavior step. Okay, Neville, lovely, erudite, interesting. How, does it, how do I show up? What actually do I do differently? So here, a moment or two on micro affirmations and micro advantages. In a pre-COVID world where equity, diversity, and inclusion were continuing to get more and more attention, very appropriately so, as we think about social justice, social inequity, and, and, and equity design, so that everybody can have their uh, ability to experience, in our case, the American dream, or however you choose to language it if you're in another country. Um, so micro negations are these things that we end up doing to each other that are these dinky little interactions. They don't seem like a big deal, but it's, it's signaling that somehow you're different, you're less than, you're not one of us. They're subtle. Uh, it could be body language, oftentimes is, could be tone of voice, but these little seemingly dinky little things can add up and these micro negations over time are what really drain the spirit and create toxic environments. The antidote, of course, then are micro affirmations. Small interactions, statements, maybe in the moment, could be public, could be private, but that esteem, that affirm, that value the people that you're with. They're tiny acts that can make a huge difference. Tiny acts of caring, again, that empathy uh, phase. It takes courage. When if that's not the norm to actually say, hey, I want to take a moment to acknowledge Susie for X, if that's not how you guys are, your regularly operating uh, procedures or, or protocols are. I'm seeing a lot more of that in the post-COVID era, a lot more care and attention to one another, which is fantastic. But microaffirmations are the antidote for those micro-negations. And micro-advantages are the subtle messages that are our way of allowing, enabling, emboldening, ennobling people to actually benefit from that. So again, these are big ideas, but the steps to do them can be really small steps. Hey, we're all human. We're all gonna leave some wake in our rear behind us. And so periodically part of that self-forgiveness is actually attending to the wake you make. So being able to say, you know, I was wrong, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, if you're not able to forgive yourself, you're not gonna forgive other people. And so, again, this requires that inside out orientation to saying, being thoughtful enough to go, you know what, the reason I can't actually say I'm sorry, it's not got nothing to do with them, it's got to do with me. My ego is too big. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not vulnerable enough with myself to go, I messed up and I'm going to own it. 
Um, so attend to the wake you make. It's all right. We all have wake. Um, and posit the question for yourself after this call and hopefully beyond, how can we create systems that explicitly and intentionally support an abundance of micro affirmations and micro advantages? If you're able to do those, you know, base hits, base hits, base hits, everybody gets a base hit, you win the game. It's not the home runs, it's not the grand slams. Those come few and far between. But you can make base hits every single day in every single interaction if you are a conscious leader and intend to and act into that intention. So finally, a couple thoughts on purpose, and then I'll open up for some questions. I'm trying to get this to the 45-minute mark to leave ample time for interaction. And bear with me for speaking fast and going through a lot of content. Uh, really, there's many definitions of purpose. I do not want to try to um, pigeonhole it. But for me, especially in today's era, it's this aspirational reason for being that's grounded in humanity. So it's for all of us, not just me again, which inspires innovation and a call to action. So there's some behavioral element to it. And it's for all organizations, again, purpose-driven organizations, not for non-social enterprise, encore careers, all organizations to provide benefit to the local and global society. I think now more than ever, we're realizing that thinking local, acting local is great, but there's going to be global implications. I don't know how that could be made any more clear to us, and this is a huge wake-up call that we have to attend to. Uh, we cannot be mindful and denying that at the same time. It's just untenable. So leading on purpose... These are some of the questions that you might want to ask yourself as you ponder these things differently. What matters to you? What really matters to you? <laughs> we've all found uh, different adjustments that we've made in our day-to-day -day schedules, uh, in our routines, in our shopping habits. Uh, so what, what really matters? How do you want to influence the world? How, how would you want to be remembered? Uh, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And then because this is a team sport, who do you want on this path with you? Hopefully you will get a chance to connect with your own sense of purpose. So let's take a minute to just unpack Ikigai for a moment. Again, it's a Japanese concept that gives us a reason for being. If all of us are seeking a higher sense of purpose and value and meaning in our lives, then Ikigai can provide that construct. You can Google this and unpack it at your own leisure, but it's really the intersection of what you love, what the world needs, what they'll pay you to do, and what you're good at. So again, from a strength space model, starting with what you're really good at, from what gives you energy, what you love, so it's not work. You do this if you had spare time and a hobby anyway. What the world is desperately needing, especially now, some of those needs have changed pretty markedly, and then what people are willing to pay you for. If you're able to bake that into your own personal purpose agenda or your organizational one, you're probably going to have a high level of fulfillment um, and success. All right, I'm gonna pop up something and you guys have to use your chat feature now and write in there what you think you saw, okay? So here, this is the one interactive portion. So if you haven't used chat, just pull up that toolbar and click on chat and choose everyone. And as soon as this pops up, don't hesitate, drop it in there. And if you've seen it before, play along. Go ahead, write in what you just saw. few of you are contributing. Thank you for that. Oh yeah, they're coming fast and furious. I'll sit tight for a second. I'm intentionally not looking at them because I don't want to get derailed here and what few minutes I have left. All right. So some of you, I'm guessing, because I'm, I'm playing blind here, eyes closed. So opportunityisnowhere.com. Some of you saw opportunityisnowhere.com. And some of you lateral thinkers might have even seen opportunityisnowhere.com. So there's no wrong or right answer. And it doesn't suggest if you saw opportunityisnowhere.com that you're a negat and we need to, you know, whack some positivity into you. It's just helping us recognize that we don't see what is, we see what we're conditioned to see. I would hope that you are going to see a world in front of us, yes, albeit with some grave 
challenges um, the, of opportunity. And it's going to take conscious leaders now more than ever to step up and be seen and make that shift. So in order to behave into Mahatma Gandhi's quote of be the change you want to see, I would like to predicate that with first, you've got to be able to see the change you want to be before you can be the change you want to see. And if we're going to tackle these big, gnarly, seemingly uh, intractable problems, whether it's climate emergency or the healthcare pandemic, it's going to require us to see things differently. Again, that creative mindset rather than reactive mindset. So I'll leave you with this. Some of you might recognize this a piece of a masterpiece in Spain that's been has been under construction for over a hundred years. It's Gaudi's masterpiece, right? Um, when people were asked in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, three guys doing the same job. What are you doing? Laying bricks. What are you doing? Making a wall. What are you doing? Creating a masterpiece. Their connection to their work, their sense of purpose as a relation to how they were contributing to the work was different. They were doing the same job. What's missing in that story, and by the way, it's not Stephen Covey's story, he just sold 7 million copies of the book, is are we focused on the bricks or are we focused on the mortar? And I would say now more than ever, we need to focus on the mortar, the glue, the social capital, the connection that brings all of us as human beings, all of us as sentient beings together. And if we're able to focus on the glue, not just the bricks, we're going to be able to build masterpieces and have phoenixes rising from the ashes. So once again, who do I want to be when I grow up in the post-COVID era? I might be coming from a place of fear. If I am, acknowledge it, but recognize it's a choice. Uh, self-regulate, self-reflect, bring yourself into the present moment. Center yourself so that you can then make the shift to the learning and growth zone because there you're going to be of much higher value to yourself, to your family, to your community, to all of us. I would hope that this experience, this global experience is going to have us wake up and be a great reveal, a reveal that unmasks some of our habituated ways of being and invite a new promise for tomorrow. Here's a quick nod to many of the friends and colleagues along the path that have been instrumental in helping my personal uh, purpose practice, uh, both learning as well as sharing. And if you want to stay connected, here's a few ways that you can do that. So with that, I'm going to um, release my stop share and invite questions, which Ms. Faustine is going to curate for us. And I am at your service. Yes, yeah, so if anybody has questions, um, please go ahead and type them in the chat option and we will answer them. So we have a question from Luke. Um, what resources and such as books, internet sources do you recommend? So I, I referenced a few, uh, I referenced Brene Brown. Uh, I love some work by Margaret Wheatley. Uh, the founder of Conscious Capitalism, Raj Sasodia, wrote a book with Michael Gelb called The Healing Organization, which I think has some really powerful reframing opportunities that suggest that maybe all businesses are actually, if, if we're all trauma-informed right now, then we all need to be in the, in the healing business. It's not just the healthcare providers. So those are a few that I would invite you to look at. Um, I, I would not just limit it to books. Books are external. Luke, as you well know. Hi, Luke. How are you doing, brother? Um, they're great resources for context. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're going to be a conscious leader, it's about the practice. So I would also look within. Don't just look without. Great. Um, we have Nancy who asks, um, what are some conscious business leaders that you admire in the corporations that you can share besides Simon Sinek? So I only use him as the reference point to transition. Um, there's a, there's, you can look, read up, start again, with, if you want to use the conscious capitalism uh, framework as a, as a jumping off point, and it's, it's a great one. It's not the only one, but you can read the first book, uh, Firms of Endearment, where he talks about different organizations. And even in the healing organization, you get some really specific examples of organizations that are, that are revisiting their reason for being. 
Um, rather than name names, uh, I'd prefer to say, uh, seek what they sought and look at how they reframed their businesses. Uh, and don't be as wedded to either the discipline, the industry, or the name of the organization. Because it's the timeless universal principles and practices that are going to shape yours. There's only one you, there's only one your organization. So while it's useful to learn from other people's experiences, mapping it one-to-one -one arguably may not work for you and your organization. So yes, let's learn from them. Let's learn from other people's experience. Uh, Mother Nature is a cruel teacher as we're finding out right now. And so if you don't get the first couple of wake-up calls, it just gets harder and harder until you actually pay attention. Um, but those, those are a few resources that you can go and glean your own um, look-alike peer organization or uh, aspirational leader or organization that you'd like to emulate and follow. All right, thank you. We have Marcy who asks, what is the next for Chamber of Purpose post-COVID? Yeah, so the Chamber of Purpose really was, you know, visualized as a social experiment to say we have the Chamber of Commerce, which in my estimation was largely focusing on that level one of businesses, which is all about profit first. And I was positing three and a half, four years ago now that we needed something deeper. People were yearning for more than just profit. Maximizing profit was, again, no margin, no mission. I'm not minimizing it, but we all don't exist just to generate profit. There's arguably, we all have mission statements, vision statement, value statements, purpose statements now more recently. And so I would, I would invite us to explore that um, orientation, if that makes sense. And so the Chamber of Purpose, to, to conclude Marcy's question, uh, continues to remain a uh, container for that. So it's, it's shifted from having some group gatherings to supporting the Purpose Awards that we couldn't do this year uh, because of the sequestration uh, to um, supporting the Love Biz Movement. There's several local authors that have written books on love at, at work, and we were holding the space for bringing love to work, again, that heart-centered part. So it's, it's to be revealed, Marcy, um, maybe with help from people like you that have a sense of how we can uh, come together and uh, make a change for the better. Great. So we have um, James who asks, what is an example of holding true to self-identity at any expense? He's not <laughs> sure if he understood that. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, um, so, so typically... Uh, we, we all have a, a, a belief system about identity. So let's just say I was trained that young men don't wear tutus and don't tip, tiptoe around the tulips in a little tutu doing ballet moves uh, because I was conditioned that that was somehow not manly. Uh, but what if my karate instructor said to me, Neville, I want you to demonstrate vulnerability and improvisation and I want you to put on a tutu and I want you to dance around here like, you know, Barishnikov or whatever. If, I, if my belief system is, oh man, that's not me, I, 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 I no, 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 uh, I'm not going to explore that new space. And I'm going to be hardened, my neuroplasticity is going to be lacking in my ability to test that. So the antithesis of that are people that do improv, like, you know, whose line is it anyway? I love those guys and gals, uh, because they take whatever suggestion is offered to them, and they lean right into it. Uh, that requires a level of openness, flexibility, and an identity that is not constrained and hardened by your worldview and personal experience. So that might be a good one. Uh, you know, how, how willing would I be to go put on a tutu right now and dance in front of all of you um, unabashedly, kind of like my bare ass naked baby photo earlier, right? So um, it, that's, hopefully that helps. We do want to see you dance in the tutu. No, <laughs> yeah, okay. You'll have to have another webinar. Um, we have Linda who asks, what is the best book you read about monitoring your emotional triggers? Wow. You know what? I would put that in the chat and see who, if there's people, um, you know, here's a great example, right? The, the default setting is the expert is speaking. Let's ask him. Well, the expert doesn't know, but the expert's not so stupid that he doesn't know that somebody on this call probably has an excellent book on that. So instead of me trying to make up an answer that's half-baked, I'm going to invite anybody on the call that has a good book on uh, monitoring triggers to actually um, add that to the chat or share it with Faustine so she can send it out after the meeting. I don't have one in terms of a book. Um, most of my uh, learning about triggers and dealing with triggers, both personally and with other people, has been through felt experience. 
So I don't, my, sadly, my answer is I don't know, but, but I'm open to anybody else who might have one. So I went ahead and go and shared that question in the chat. So if anybody has any suggestions that would like to share with the group, go ahead and um, type them in the chat. Thank you. Um, I'm going to look and see if there's any more other questions. There's a lot of great comments from you, Neville. Um, the L in your name stands for love. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll work on it. Thank you for that. Blessings. <laughs> um, we'll go through. So it looks like um, we don't have any more other questions. We made it through. We made it through. So if you do have any questions for Neville, you think of anything afterwards, um, you can reach out to me. I can forward it to him or you can reach out to him directly. I'm sure he's more happy to help answer any questions that you have that you think about um, after this webinar. Um, I know he's a great thought leadership um, in the business community as well, helping all of our businesses and just business people in the business community for sure. Um, but thank you everyone for attending for today's webinar. Um, this webinar was recorded, so we posted on events.bbcommunity.org if you need to review any of the information and sign up for additional webinars. But thank you again, Neville, for taking time out of your busy day. Hey, Ms. Faustine, um, uh, since we have two minutes, can I take one minute and play the bell one more time for everybody? Yes, take them of out course. Does that work? Of okay, course. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I didn't want you to have people just jettison on us. So yes, we'll one more end minute, it with the we'll bell, Neville. <laughs> And the one question for you, Ms. Faustine, technically, is there a way for me to see the chat later? Because I was not looking at that during the... Yes, I can forward that to you. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, blessings to everyone. Be that conscious leader that the world needs. We desperately need you now more than ever. Uh, you matter. You're super important. And I'm going to take you out with the healing bell, which has been... It's a crystal bell. It's tuned to open up our heart energy. So may you have a big open heart and may you be filled with love and empathy, compassion, joy, or any other qualities that you're looking for in your day to day. Here we go. Thank you so much, Neville, again. Have a great day, everyone. Please stay safe out there.